You know, I've heard some people say that history is a great big circle, just keeps going around and around and around. That is not true. History is linear. It is moving quickly forward to a great end, a grand finale, if you like. And this grand finale is the end times, the return of Christ. In this series of messages, I will tell you about it from the Word of God. Stay tuned. of Jesus' parables teach us the importance of hard and diligent work, the importance of accomplishments, and the importance of free will giving. This business of taking away by force from those who work hard, squander it on some government program, as we are seeing these days very clearly, is contrary to the Scripture. It destroys the very dignity with which God has created us. Listen very carefully, please. This is very important because there's a big problem in our churches today. There's a big problem among the Christian community today. We have developed in the churches such pietistic view of Christianity that has left out one of the most important aspects of life one of the most important aspects of our existence, namely work. We have falsely taught that God belongs to Sunday and then the rest of the week belongs to us and to our employer and belongs to somebody else. It's plainly wrong. All of the week belongs to God. Every hour of every moment of every hour of every day belong to God. And that is why the Apostle Paul concludes his second epistle to the Thessalonians, focusing on that one important aspect of life, namely work. And if you look at the passage, you can turn to it with me. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning verse 6, all the way to the end. This is the concluding in the series of messages, the end of history and you, from Second Thessalonians. And in this passage, Paul actually goes as far as to say that those who are able to work but refuse to work as a distinct from those who can't get a job. Okay, I want to be clear on that. I don't want anybody to misunderstand me. You with me? Can I get a witness? He is talking about the person who can work and there is work but refuse to work, he says, should be ostracized. (laughs) Let's just be upfront with each other here. Some Christians have a truly magnificent wrong view of work. They really do. They see it as a drudgery. They see it as a curse. They see it as something, you know, they just have to do. And it's symbolized in the bumper sticker that says, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. No, I'm privileged to go to work. Such perspective on work is not only totally contrary to the Word of God, but it robs human beings of their God-given instinctive value that comes from work. It devalues the honor of work. It displays disdain for that which God calls good. You see, historically speaking, when the Christian face burst upon the Roman Empire, Romans and Greeks both had such a poor view of work and labor. They did. Uh, They view it as beneath their dignity. Never dignified it. And yet the Bible from cover to cover tells us that hard work, ownership, productivity, providing employment, producing profits are all should be done for the glory of God. You see, I know the word prophet is a dirty word, but that Bible, I mean, how how many of you know the parable of the talent? And Jesus praised the one who doubled and took 10, brought 10. The other one brought five. He condemned only the one who did nothing. Why? Because God created man with an instinctive desire to work hard, with an instinctive desire to produce. 
with the instinctive desire to conserve and to earn <laughs> and, yes, to own. But why? Because when we faithfully work, we are imitators of God because God works. Jesus said, I work and my Father works. And when we are imitators of God, we bring glory to God. Can I get a witness? Amen. The Bible said in Genesis 131 that God saw all of his work. He saw all of that he made. He saw all of his handiwork. And he said it was very good. He saw his handiwork and he was pleased. God blessed his work. God blesses our work. And we believe in ownership because God is the owner of everything. And he lets us own something. Not for selfish reason. Not so we can grab for everything we can. No, so that we too can help others. So that can, we too can help others stand on their own feet. Yeah. Ephesians 5, 1, Paul said, Be imitators of God as dearly loved children. Yeah. In fact, when we take ownership, we bring joy to the heart of God. For we work for God first, not for the boss. You see it clearly in the book of Ecclesiastes. When Solomon found himself looking at things from a human perspective, from his own eyes, not from God's perspective. When he got into the flesh, not the spirit. Among other things, he messed up royally, but among other things, he saw labor and work as a curse. But then when he comes in under God's authority and he begins to see things, see life, see work from God's point of view, he said in chapter 3, verse 13, work is a gift of God. And in the New Testament, we learn that work is a spiritual duty. It really is. It is an opportunity for us to glorify God. It is an opportunity for us to glorify the Lord. Obviously, in that particular church in Thessalonica, there were some idle people. There were some in the congregation who were leeching off the congregation. And Paul doesn't tell us why. The important thing is that their idleness is a sin that they needed to be repented of. That's really the point of it. He is seeking for those people to repent of their sin of idleness. In fact, in these two letters, First and Second Thessalonians, this issue has been mentioned three times. And in this passage, the final passage, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul gives us six incentives to motivate those who are practicing the sin of laziness to repent of their sins and go to work. First, ostracism by disfellowshipping with the idle person. In modern day language, we'd say, dissim. If they're Paul speaking in the vernacular, they diss those folks. Secondly, Paul uses his own life example as an incentive, his own model, life model. Thirdly, hunger. Fourthly, harmony. Fifth, shame. And number six is love. Let's look at them very, very quickly. Ostracism. Paul here is not giving them a suggestion, he's giving them a command. And it is not a command from his own apostolic authority, but it's a command from the authority of Jesus himself. Listen to what he said. We command you in the name of Jesus Christ, ostracize such a person. The word here means keep away from such a person, avoid such a person, pull back from such a person. The sentimentality that we are living in today, we have turned all biblical injunctions upside down. In fact, in Matthew 18, the Lord Jesus Christ, this ostracism is the third step in a three-step program. <laughs> in Matthew 18, Jesus said, you go to the person and you talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. If they refuse to repent, you go in the presence of witnesses and you talk to that person. If they still refuse to repent, then you ostracize them. It's the third stage. Before you pull back, before you let the person know, that this is what you're going to do. 
Paul is saying those who can work and refuse to work are unruly. That's the word he is, unruly in some of your translations. It means out of line or out of order or contrary to Scripture. Then he gives them the second incentive by using his personal example, his own life. Paul sought not to be a burden upon the Thessalonians. He had every right, as he said, to live off the preaching of the gospel. And he did receive from other churches that supported him. But he saw that this congregation cannot take it. They, they cannot take the burden. And he did not want to be an extra burden on them. And so he's saying this, lazy people, don't you be a burden upon that congregation either. I have struggled with this just about all my life, but certainly I've struggled with the issue of setting an example in my personal devotional time and in personal walk with God because there is no use asking somebody to put on the hours if I'm not putting the hours myself. There is no use me standing here and telling you the blessings of pouring into God, not just the tithe, which is only a beginning, but double and triple and test God like he said. Jesus said, given will be given back to you, heaped over. <laughs> and it's no use, I tell you, that I am standing here saying to you, there are blessings I can't explain to you. There are blessings untold when you stop nickeling and diming God. Should you give the tithe after the taxes, before the taxes, but become a hilarious giver? I cannot tell you the blessings without having experienced it myself. Example is a powerful thing. And so Paul goes on to give us a third incentive. Verse 10, hunger, hunger. <laughs> I know Paul is brutally honest here when he said that anyone who has work, can work, refuse to work, should not eat. I know a lot of people, I heard them, they say, oh, this is harsh. The fourth incentive the apostle Paul uses here is harmony. Look at verses 11, 12, and 13. What has harmony got to do with this? Ah, he said, because those who are not busy working hard, they become busy buddies. It's not my word, it's his words. <laughs> he said they become busy buddies. And busy buddies tend to destroy the unity and the harmony of the body of Christ. The idol are always gossiping and gossip always creates disharmony and disunity and discord. And the danger of these deadbeats, Paul is saying, is they're not only creating disharmony, uh, but they cause the hardworking believers to become unable to judge who is really needy and who is not. And the problem is when people get jaded and weary and tired, and then they tend to tie everybody with the same brush. And we must never, 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 never do that. We must always focus on those who are in need, and we must always be ready to help those who are in need and cannot help themselves. It is of vital importance that you get this. It is of vital importance you understand this, because we are called of God to help the genuinely needy. We are called of God to give generously to those who are in, who are truly in need. We are called of God to care for those who truly cannot take care of themselves. That's the Word of God. And then the fifth incentive that Paul uses, verse 14, is shame. Shame those spongers. He doesn't use the word spongers. I want to be sure that you understand what I'm saying, what he's saying. You know. He's saying individually and collectively, that person who is refusing to work should be ashamed. We don't use that word anymore. I know. At least a powerful biblical word. Why? What is the purpose? Why does Paul want a person to be ashamed? Ah, so that it may lead them to repentance. That's the whole purpose of it. It's not to punish, but it's to lead to repentance. The very purpose of discipline, which is a dirty word in most churches today, <laughs> is to lead people to repentance. Well, how else you protect the flock from predators? Shaming someone can be a very powerful motivation. When I was a, a rebellious teenager, belonging to a family that was not only well known in the city, but it was known for its godliness, I was always reminded 
of the shame that I'm bringing to the family name. And let me testify to you right now. <laughs> Even in my rebellion, that was a powerful motivator. Six, verse 15. Paul made sure before he leaves the subject that we must never hate that person. Don't personally resent that person. Don't deal angrily with such a person, but rather lovingly admonish that person. Galatians 6, 1, the apostle Paul said, if someone is caught in sin, who you are spiritual should do what? Restore him gently. Our motive must always be longing to restore an individual. Always. We long for a person to repent and turn to the Lord, and then we'll open our arms and welcome them. And that's why Paul concludes with a prayer for the believers in the church of Thessalonica. A prayer that the Lord of peace grant them peace in all circumstances. With peace and grace of God that can only come to the person who is trusting and believing the loving sovereign God as history moves toward its own end as we wait for the revelation of Christ coming, as we await the final stage of redemption. He said, during that time of waiting, the peace and the grace of God will abide in the obedient child. How? Because God himself is at peace with himself. That's who he is. He is at peace with himself. God is never uh, under stress. God is never worried. God is never anxious. God is never fearful. God is never unsure. God is never threatened. He's always at perfect peace and harmony within himself. And that's the kind of peace that Paul is praying that would be for every obedient child of the living God. That all of the turmoil that Satan throws us in and the circumstances throw us in will never disturb our inward peace. For it is the grace of God that found us in our sin. It is the grace of God that saved us from sin. It is the grace of God that sustains us all the way until we get home to heaven. Amen. Amen. Amen.